Now, we're in chapter 9 here in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be looking today at verses 14 through 29. I chose to entitle this particular installment of our Bible study, uh, Help My Unbelief. Many years ago, I can't even tell you how long ago, it's been quite a number of years, uh, over 40 years ago, uh, there's a, a comment that is made where, and we'll be seeing that in just a moment, when uh, in uh, verse 24 here of chapter 9, where the father cries out with tears to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said, Lord, I believe, and I memorized it in the King James Version. He said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And so we're going to be looking today at that cry of the Father, help my unbelief. That's a cry I believe that many fathers in this place today uh, watching online, that's a, that's a cry that many of us who are fathers might have made ourselves in the past. And, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give an introduction. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 16, and then I'm going to lay a foundation in introduction. I want to stress uh, in my introduction about the importance of faith and uh, things that relate to it. So I can lay this uh, for us as we get to the point where the man is saying, I do believe, but it's unbelief I'm dealing with. And that's something that I believe is a very, uh, very um, common phrase that many believers might be able to make themselves. And so we're looking at the subject of this man's unbelief. So let's begin reading together here in chapter 9 of Mark's Gospel at verse 14. We'll read to verse 16, and then we'll get into our study. Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 14, reading to verse 16. Mark writes, When he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him greeted him, and he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? Now, I mentioned recently that there are various ways that Christians are referred to in the New Testament. We have a tendency of speaking of us now simply as being believers or Christians. We especially say, well, that person's a Christian. I was mentioning that there are various ways that uh, Christians are referred to in the New Testament, and I was sharing with you that the most common word in Scripture to refer to a Christian was the word disciple, and we spoke of that. The word Christian was not necessarily commonly used to speak of followers of, of Jesus. Often believers or Christians were simply referred to as the church, and, and that, that term, the church, is used in the New Testament around 114 times. So that was a very common way to speak of believers, a community or a fellowship of those who have committed themselves to Christ. And so believers are referred to as the church, and and are called Christians, but even as I just said, they are often referred to as simply believers because that's how we were saved. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's how you're saved. Acts records that when Paul and Silas were jailed in the city of Philippi in, in northern Greece, that they had been jailed because he had cast out a demon from a, a fortune teller. And when that happened, that provoked a near riot. While in jail... Paul and Silas were praying, and the Scripture says they were singing hymns, and the other prisoners were listening. At midnight, there was an earthquake, and the prison doors were opened. Well, when that happens, the jailer awoke, and he saw the cell doors were opened, and he thought the prisoners undoubtedly had all escaped and was about to kill himself. He was going to kill himself because he would have been sentenced to death for losing these prisoners, so he's going to take his own life. But when he was about to kill himself, Paul said, we are here, don't harm yourself. Well, this jailer was so amazed that he, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And that's where Acts 16, 31, all of us have heard this scripture. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Disciples are what we are to be. But believers is a common way to speak of us. This is because we are known by whom we believe in and what we believe. And believers are those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and, and have become part of the Christian community. In John's gospel, John records that after Jesus' resurrection, that Jesus appeared to some of the disciples. And Thomas wasn't present when he did. 
And he didn't believe when they told him that Jesus had appeared. In John 20, verse 25, the second portion of that scripture, he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, a week later, Thomas was with the apostles when Jesus came and he stood amongst them and he said to Thomas, touch me, see that it is me and stop doubting, he said, and believe. In response to this, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And in John 20, verse 29, Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, there's an old saying all of us are familiar with. Seeing is believing. But in Christianity, believing is seeing. This is because as believers, we live a life that is built on faith. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the Holy Spirit, all of whom we haven't seen. The whole foundation of our lives is built on faith in God and what he has said. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul said that we walk by faith. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, though you have not seen him, you love him, even though you do not see him now. You believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. And so this is a, a subject of belief. We're going to be looking at, at a father in a moment who says, I believe, but I'm having a problem with unbelief. You see, at this point, Jesus has been with his disciples for over two years. They've been with him. They were taught by him. They've seen his miracles. They served with him. But he's about to depart. He's finalizing his ministry to them. They'll, they'll soon be entrusted to take the message of the gospel, not just to Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria, but unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And he's no longer going to be with them. And they're going to have their world rocked because Jesus is going to die they have critical things to learn from him, especially in the realm of faith. And what he's going to be teaching them in just a moment, once again, is a lesson concerning the power of faith. And so it begins at verse 14 in this way. When he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Now remember with me that Jesus had camped overnight in the mountain. Peter, James, and John had been with him. Luke chapter 9, verse 37 says, the next day he descended the mountain and rejoined his other disciples. As he's descending this mountain, there's a great multitude that has formed below. And now as we see it, his, his, his men are surrounded by a crowd and religious experts, they're called the scribes, are arguing with them. Now as is so often true, mountaintop experiences are often followed by valleys. It seems to me that the enemy likes to stir up problems after God blesses us. We used to go to uh, our men's uh, retreats, and perhaps in the future when everything uh, flows again, we'll do it again. But we used to go to a mountain for our men's retreat. And I would tell the guys, I would say, okay, guys, we're about to go home. Um, you've been in the mountain, and the Lord has met you in a mountaintop experience. I said, but don't be surprised when you leave the mountain and you go back down. Don't be surprised if the devil begins to attack you. Sometimes he's wearing your wife's dress. <laughs> just kidding. I see those claws. I'm just kidding. But the fact is, we need to take our mountaintop experiences and put them into practice when we're in the valleys. And that's what the Lord is going to teach these men. Because the lessons that are learned on mountains are lived in valleys. Jesus arrives. As he arrives, there's a multitude. But notice with me, there are also those who are called scribes arguing with him. The scribes were the experts of the law of Moses. And they were the ones who pronounced uh, doctrine and teaching and all very, very respected. And there they are arguing with his men. Now, these religious leaders were often looking for something to discredit Jesus with. And in Luke chapter 11, verses 53 and 54, 
Uh, Luke writes, as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. Well, since Jesus wasn't there, they took opportunity to argue with this man. And they would do that because they wanted to undermine these men's trust in Jesus Christ. As we saw in an earlier passage, uh, we saw this happening in Matthew, at Matthew's house when Jesus had gone there uh, for supper. Matthew had invited his friends who were tax collectors and sinners, and this bothered these religious leaders. In Matthew 9, verse 11, it says, When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So this is an old tactic. If you can't defeat the teacher, undermine his students' trust in him. In Mark 3, 25, it says, If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. So this is a common tactic. Jesus isn't there. So the scribes begin to argue with Jesus' men, the nine who had remained behind. Well, in verse 15, it says, Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, greeted him. When Jesus arrived on the scene, the people saw him. They came and greeted him. And this has become common because of his amazing works and his teachings. But as they're greeting him, Jesus immediately approaches the scribes. In verse 16, it says, He asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them. Now that word discussing is a Greek word that means to debate or argue. They weren't just having a conversation, they were arguing, disputing, they were causing problems with his men. And so Jesus as a shepherd immediately protects his disciples from the onslaught of these religious leaders. Your Bible teaches you that that Jesus is the good shepherd and as a good shepherd he watches over his sheep. In Psalm 91, 14, it says, Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. In Psalm 121, verse 8, The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. He's a good shepherd watching his sheep. And so his question reveals to us that he takes the tax on his disciples very personally. Now, we see an example of this when, when Jesus confronted Saul before he became Paul. I was mentioning this to you recently. This man, Saul, who later is the Apostle Paul, Saul had received authority to bring believers to Jerusalem that he might try them as religious heretics. And he was on his way to a place called Damascus. And the Bible tells us in Acts 9, 3 through 5, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. When you're, when you're hurting one of mine, Jesus was saying, you are attacking me. He takes it personally. He took it personally then, and by the way, he still does to this day. These religious leaders were undermining their faith, provoking Jesus to action. In Matthew 18, verse 6, he, he said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he was drowned in the depth of the sea. When you go to Israel, we have an opportunity to go to a place called Capernaum. And while you're in Capernaum, there is a millstone that's on display there. It weighs several hundred pounds. It looks like a, a large wheel. And that was the picture Christ was giving. He said, it would be better for you if this several hundred pound stone was tied around your neck and you were dropped in the midst of the Sea of Galilee for offending one of these little ones who believe in me. He takes it personally. And so Jesus challenged the scribes to answer, but they didn't have a chance to respond. Notice what happens in verse 17. He had just said, what are you discussing with them? Then one in the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. It Wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth. He becomes rigid. I spoke to your disciples. They could not cast it out to cast it out, but they could not. And so he answered him and said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here. Now, I want you to notice something here. Jesus had challenged the scribes, but 
they didn't have a chance to respond because someone from the crowd cried out, I brought you my son. So when you combine other accounts of this event, we get a, a better picture. Again, Matthew 17, verses 14 and 15, speaking of the same thing, Matthew writes, when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. The word epileptic is actually a word that is translated moonstruck. It also could be translated lunatic. It was not specifically the disease of epilepsy, but the symptoms of it that are being described here. But he's falling into the fire and often into the water. In Luke 9, 38, suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look at my son, for he is my only, my only child. And so that adds a layer of emotion for us. This father's frantic. He knows that this isn't simply physical. He knows that what's taking place is spiritual. He knew his son was demon-possessed and was under incredible attack by demons. In Luke 9, 39, it says the spirit seizes him and suddenly, he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. The word destroying literally means crushing or mauling him. He's abusing him is what he's saying. This is what is taking place. Matthew 17, 15 again says he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So the demon is abusing this little boy, driving him to kill himself. And in the hurting of the son, there's the hurting of the father. Because any man who has a son and loves his son, if something happens to the son, it's something that gets, it hurts and affects the father. We're very protective. I'm going to talk to you as a father for a moment. I'm going to share some things. But I can tell you this, that I have two sons, my biological boys, and I can tell you that they're men now. They're not children in any way, except emotionally. No, they're not, they're not children anymore, but I can speak to you. And this to me is a highly personal, highly personal passage because I began to learn this in layers many years ago, prior to being saved, having small sons and being where I am now. So I've learned layers of things as I've gone through this particular um, passage many times in the years that I've, I've ministered and been a believer. And I can tell you that you have a very protective feeling for your son. And when your son gets hurt in any way, it hurts you. I still remember when my daughter Corinne came running into the house. Corinne was just a few years old. She wasn't that old. My son Joseph was maybe four years, three or four years old at the time. And she came running into the house and she said, Daddy, Daddy, the next door neighbor just hit Joseph. And the next door neighbor was in high school and hit him in the stomach. And my son was about four years old. And I went out like a lion. I have to be honest with you, I was going to kill that kid. And I was going to take his father too. I mean, I was in. I'm telling you the truth. Marie can tell you that. You know? So I understand when you see your child hurt. You know, I talked to the mother, settled the problem. God was very gracious. Kept, his father didn't come out because I was really going to take him out. I'm not kidding because the guy had been acting the punk for a long time. But that's a different story. I shouldn't even, <laughs> shouldn't even bring that up. Pastor Dave, you had a temper? Well, that was many years ago. You get protective. Every daddy knows this. You get protective. That's my baby. That's my baby. You get protective. It's just there. If you don't get protective... Ask that God will give you a heart for protection for your kids. You get It's natural. It's something God builds into a man. That's the way it is. And when my child's hurt, I get hurt. When I can't do something, I get hurt. I want to take that on myself. I want to do something. And that's what the father is feeling. I want to build this with you. Because that's what's going on right now with this man. My fa the father's saying, my son is very ill. He gets thrown into the into the fire. He gets thrown into the water. He convulses. And, and when you start looking at all of the things, and I've read this too, but I'm going to point them out again, you'll, you'll see what's going on. Because there's a situation taking place, and, and it's something that is, is, 
beyond their ability to, to handle. These men can't do it. When, when Peter, James, and John were on a mountain, these men, these others, were involved in warfare, and, and their lack of success reveals that they're still unprepared to handle this kind of attack. You see, when people think that, that serving Satan is good, this is how Satan treats his subjects. And I want you to see this. Look at how the demon abuses this little guy. The spirit makes him mute robbing his speech so he can't call for help. It seizes him, which speaks of eagerly taking him and possessing him. It, it hurls him to the ground, which causes bruising and cutting. He foams at the mouth, which causes dehydration. He gnashes his teeth. He's grating his teeth, causing bruising of his mouth and his gums. His body becomes rigid. The word rigid speaks of being withered or dried up, causing cramps. He suddenly screams because he senses the demon shrieks and there's nothing the father can do. It causes violent convulsions, causing him to choke on his own saliva. It scarcely ever leaves him, which means he's hurt and tortured night and day. He's, he's, he's got a sense of isolation because he's looked at as being a lunatic and he has no friends. It throws him in the water to drown him, the fire to burn him tries to kill him the fire burns him and because the fire has burned this little guy's skin he may very well have become scarred this is my son shrieks isolated in pain possibly scarred bruised gums teeth that have been are being worn down by his grating constant gnashing Isolated, no friends, nothing. Listen, I, I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, but they could not. I brought my boy to you, but you were on the mountain. So I brought them to your men, but they couldn't help him. And Jesus' answer in verse 19 is interesting because he says, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. He answered, faithless generation. The word faithless is unbelieving. That's what the word means. It means those who are not trusting God. Interestingly enough, he's not primarily rebuking the crowd. He's speaking first and foremost to his men, his disciples. Their unbelief actually causes him anger and is frustrating and even painful to him. This is really what would be called an expression of exasperation, and he's exasperated, frustrated with his men. Remember, he had sent them into ministry. He had already, in chapter 6, sent them out to minister. It says that they had, in verse 13 of, of Mark 6, they had cast out many demons, anointed with oil, many who were sick, and healed them. They had already cast demons out. This is something they, done, they had done. They, they, they failed this time, but they'd done it in the past. And so he says, how long shall I bear with you? How long must I put up with your lack of faith? Why are you not learning the lessons I've been teaching you? And then in verse 19, he gives a command, a simple command, bring them to me. Well, it says in verse 20, they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. He asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood. And often he's thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. But this is the part where I can get emotional. I know you've never seen that here. <laughs> These, this is one of those portions of Scripture that... I've been aware of for a long time. I've been aware of this scripture for over 50 plus years now. When you're young in the Lord, I was unmarried. You, you read it in one way and you highlight certain things. As you grow older, 
Your life continues to blossom. Various experiences occur. You get married. You have your children, things of that nature. Ultimately, for me, you, your grandchildren. And, and so layers of experience begin to uh, occur as you grow older in the Lord. So there are levels that I've personally seen the Lord do things in my own life. And so because of that, it's uh, it, I have emotion that's attached to that. So I'm going to try my best not to make this about any emotion you might see come out of me. Hopefully, it'll make some sense to you as I'm trying to share these things. I want you to notice in verse 20, they brought him to him, and immediately the Spirit begins to tear on him, convulsed him, begins to tear him. The, the Bible tells us here that the Spirit convulsed him and he fell to the ground. The spirit within the boy recognized Jesus and knew what was about to take place. So when he saw Jesus, he tore the boy, he convulsed him. Now we saw this kind of thing when Jesus had cast out a demon of a man in a man in, in a synagogue. In Mark 1 26, it says, When the unclean spirit convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Well, the boy fell on the ground. He began to wallow. He was foaming at the mouth. And the Spirit made one more effort to destroy this boy. He'd been tormenting him for some time. He didn't want to let him go. As this is taking place, and you can imagine, I mean, this is taking place. The father's watching his son, and Jesus begins to speak. Verse 21, how long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood. Now he's calmly speaking to the father. How long has this been happening? This wasn't a way to gather information. It was a way to communicate compassion. Jesus cared about the pain the father endured. He knew that that man, man needed to unload. How long? How long? And the father said, from childhood. That word childhood can be translated from boyhood, but it's also a word that can be used to speak of infancy. This has been taking place all of his young life since he was an infant. He's been in this condition. It's often thrown him into the fire, into the water to destroy, to kill him. And so this is where it becomes personal for me. I put myself in this father's place. He's desperate. He's desiring more than anything that Jesus would deliver his tormented son. Put yourself in that place if you're a father. For years, you haven't had peace. Your only son is suicidal, driven by a demon. My firstborn was a little girl whom I love with all of my heart, my Corinne. My secondborn was my son, David. We didn't know, we weren't, we weren't going and finding out is it male or female or anything like people do today. Oh, we know the sex and then you have those reveals. We didn't do that. We just kind of wanted to just let nature have its course in, in boy, girl, and that's the way we did it. Now, I'm kind of a traditional person in, in a lot of ways. And one of those things about being a traditional person is I wanted a son to carry on my name. Maybe he'd do a better job with it, right? So, Marie and I were talking, my wife, and who do you want to name the baby if it's a boy? I said, Aaron. Aaron is my favorite name. I love the name Aaron. It's a beautiful name. She said, don't you want to name him David? I said, uh, I'm not really in love with that name. Seriously, I it's just, you know. I'm going to name him Aaron. She said, you want to call him David? Middle name? I said, okay, we'll call him Aaron David. That was it. It was settled. It was settled, right? We're going to have Aaron David. That's what we're going to have. And so there I am, captive when Marie's having the baby. They force us now to be in there. <laughs> and I'm just waiting for whatever. And the doctor says, you had your boy and hands me this little boy. Yeah. 
What are you going to name him? David. <laughs> and that's how he got his name, David Aaron. David Aaron. When my Joseph was born, my second son, and the doctor delivered all four of our babies, same doctor, he walks up and he hands me this little baby, my Joseph. It's the only time that I ever felt this impulse, but I, he handed me my, my son, and I looked at him, and I lifted him like this, and I said, this one shall serve the Lord. This one shall serve the Lord. I prophesied over my son. There is something. Every daddy has this. Or should. There are dreams that you have. This one shall be blessed. I want God to bless you. That's how I am. I've been that way for a long time. That's not unusual. This man was the same way, I'm sure. When he was born, he blessed God. You gave me a son, my, my only child. You gave me a son. And I deeply, I deeply love this, this baby. And you have your hopes and you have your dreams. One day, may this, this, this boy grow to be a great man. But since he was very young in this man's life, his dream became a nightmare, and his hope was lost. You are forced to watch him constantly because he may kill himself if you're not on the alert. You look at him, and, and this beautiful little guy is scarred. He's been tortured. He screams constantly. He falls. He hurts himself. He can't go near water, and he can't go near an open fire. His mouth, his gums are bruised. He has no friends. Who wants to play with a little crazy boy, right? Who wants to play with him? So he's alone. And sometimes you're outside. And the other children in the village are running by, and they're, they're laughing, and they're playing, and running. But your son can't join them. He can't run. He can't play. He doesn't laugh. He shrieks. He's alone. And it hurts. It hurts your son, but it hurts you. Because he's your only baby. And the hopelessness that you live with has overwhelmed you. And then one day you hear, you hear of a young rabbi, a man named Jesus. And you heard, this is a man who casts out demons. And you summon everything within you and, and you come to see him, but he's not there. You're told that he's got some men that he's training. They're over here, so you go and speak to them. And you say, can you help? Can you help me? And they try their best, but they're unable. They can't. And the disappointment overwhelms you. It causes greater pain. And now you're almost completely without hope. But you take one last shot because the master has come. And you say, oh, I need your help. Can you help me? He says in verse 22, he has thrown, he, often he has thrown him both into the fire, into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us. Help us. If you can do anything. And he cries this out. Help us. Because you're not only helping my son, you're helping us. I've given up hope, and to be honest, you're, you're my last chance. I'm at the end of my rope, and I'm not even going to pretend to have faith. I have it, but not that much. 
My faith is almost gone. It's nearly exhausted. But Jesus in verse 23 says, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes, You've said, if I can do anything. You say, if I can do anything. But the reality rests on whether you can believe. And by this statement, he forces him to deal with this lack of faith. I have enough power to do what you're asking. But do you have enough faith to receive it? The father has seen the compassionate way that Jesus had spoken to him. And now he's asking him to show compassion in a tangible way by delivering his son. If you can do anything, he had said, but Jesus responds, if you can believe. You see, Jesus is willing, but we often simply don't believe that he will help us. Psalm 50 verse 15 says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. You shall glorify me. So when Jesus says, if you can believe, immediately, verse 24, the, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. The word unbelief means my unfaithfulness, my faithlessness, my lack of faith, my weakness of faith. I believe. I have things I believe in. I believe you can do that for others. I'm having a tough time believing that you can do it for me. My faith isn't what it's supposed to be. I, I ask that you supply me with the grace to put my entire trust in you. Not only am I pleading for you to deliver my son, but I also ask for you to deliver me. And in spite of the Father's plaguing doubt, God is not limited by our faith. Ephesians 3.20 says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. And Jesus is going to move. Notice verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, came out of him, he became as one dead, so that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. I command you, deaf and dumb spirit, come out of him. Enter him no more. You resisted my disciples, but you cannot resist me. In Psalm 33, 8 and 9, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke and it was done. And the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. But he could not resist tearing him one last time. And by the way, this is how the enemy treats his victims. And he still draws people to follow him. The child appeared dead, but Jesus gently lifted him to his feet. And as this is taking place... The disciples are wondering what's going on here. Verse 28, when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind, of, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Why couldn't you do it? It's interesting that they, want, they wondered at their lack of success while ignoring their own lack of faith. They didn't see that faith and results would be linked. He said, it's your unbelief. You only trust when I'm next to you. You need to trust always. Faith trusts when we have nothing. Faith trusts when we feel forsaken, when we don't know if he's listening, or when we begin to doubt that he even cares. In Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Why couldn't we succeed? Well, this one doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. You relied on your previous victories and the result was relying on your own power. Matthew gives us more insight in Matthew 17, verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Listen, you need to learn that God's power is revealed in response to faith and believing prayer. You relied on your prior experience, but not on my present availability. 
Spiritual warfare is not momentary. So be prepared for the battle. Remain steadfast. Trust God for the victory. In 1 John 5, 4, everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Men, if you're going to be taking the word of God out, you need to understand that when I'm not with you, I still am with you. You need to learn that. You need to learn that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You need to learn that. You need to learn that it's not large faith at all. It's a small faith in a great God that gets things done. And if you're going to take this message out to the world, you need to know that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you need to know that you can do those things because I gave you power to do those things. Hold fast. Don't let go. The enemy has a way of trying to cause you to think it's hopeless. That's what he does. He steals your hope. But Jesus Christ is our hope, and he lives forever. And some of you perhaps are going through some tough times, but remember, you're going through them. You don't stay there. You're going somewhere greater than anything that you've ever experienced. You need to understand that. Hold fast, hold fast, hold fast, and see what God can do. These men needed to learn to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, but so do we. We need to learn that he never, never fails. He always gives us the victory. Sometimes it comes in ways we didn't expect. Sometimes it's a different victory than we thought we were supposed to have. But we always, at the end of the day, realize he didn't leave us. He was with us, and he provided for us. Why? Because he he loves us. He loves us. Don't forget that. Your God loves you. He loves you so much he gave his son for you. He loves you. If you walk out with anything, walk out with hope and the love of God. All things are possible with Jesus Christ. Hold fast. Father, we ask that you would work with us.